You're listening to The Edge, everything bass fishing. Coming to you worldwide from MegaWare Kill Guard Studios. Hey, 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 what's going on, Bass Edge Nation? We're back for another episode, the late March edition. Appreciate y'all tuning in. Don't forget to click that like, subscribe, and comment below. Man, we've got a great show for you today. Bassmaster Classic is over, and uh, what a great event, man. Grand Lake is, I think, one of the best classic venues there is. It's... it's uh, so many ways to catch fish there. Clear water, dirty water. Uh, this past week up there at Grand Lake in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was just absolutely fantastic from a from a angler's perspective. You had a little bit of everything. You had some scoping. Uh, you had some classic old school bank fishing, flipping, pitching, docking. Man, uh, shallow water wood jerking i mean man it, it just had everything the show was great i was happy to be there for three days i was crazy busy just all over the place i had to had the opportunity to help my buddy brian schmidt be a caddy in the event man i gotta say these guys were through the gauntlet on travel it was absolutely amazing it's about 90 plus miles from the tulsa area to the lake and then back every day Man, uh, these guys, you know, they're getting up at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning, bailing out at 4.20, 4.30, going fishing all day, coming back, weigh-in shows, don't finish until 7.30, 8 o'clock, media, uh, family time. Uh, they've got so much going on, man, and uh, getting to sleep maybe at 10, 10.30 at night. It's a, it's a whirlwind what these what these anglers go through, specifically at this venue um, up there at Tulsa and Grand Lake. But man, I got I got to tell you, it uh, again from a fan perspective, it was great. Um, I wouldn't say it was awesome show turnout. Uh, this is the third classic up at Tulsa, uh, Oklahoma, and you tend to see as uh, not only just classics but elite series events as well as they continue to go back to a venue multiple times you know the the uh, starstruckness of the anglers and and the process and understanding professional bass fishing kind of dwindles a little bit i think you get your hardcore anglers there and and family members that that just you know kind of live and and breathe bass fishing which is which is maybe some of the greatest kind of fan there is honestly i know i'm one of those and, and i'm sure many of you are too but uh man it's just um um you know it's great to see when these really huge crowds come out and uh love to see the classic continue um obviously at new venues going forward they've already signed a deal next year obviously going back to dallas for for next year's classic going to be held at ray roberts it's actually in fort worth um not sure of you know how they're going to set up the show this year i'm sure the uh, coliseum is going to be there at dickie's coliseum and and uh you know another nice venue there but uh should be a lot of fun to uh check out everything that's going on with the classic next year with that being said congrats to justin hamner man what a freaking show um he just sealed the deal led from day one uh you know or, or led pretty much the entire way uh cody huff had a great event he finished third place man we are lucky we're gonna have cody on right here in this episode kind of break down the classic understand the patterns, kind of get his view on how things happen. I, and I got to say, you know, Cody was up there, I believe it was second place after day one. And uh, he had a challenging morning on day two. But uh, Cody, a young angler as he is, although he's fished a ton of tournaments, obviously, at this time, had a great college career, good career over at MLF, qualified for the elites, obviously made the Bassmaster Classic. And Man, he had to make some major adjustments. We're going to talk to Cody about those adjustments that he went through throughout the event. And um, there was a lot of shallow cranking going on. Cody, one of those shallow crankers. But, man, he also had some water to himself. Going to try to, you know, kind of break down what he thought the process was of, you know, maybe where some of those fish moved. Was it more isolated cover? Was it just a one fish here, one fish there kind of situation? So it's going to be great to have Cody on the show. So uh, we're going to break that down with him. Man, there is so much going on right now in pro bass fishing. Uh, 
We got a DQ from the Santee Bassmaster Open event. Brian New uh, had had a deal going on where um, he was unfortunately seen as uh, acting unsportsmanlike. True, untrue. Everybody has an opinion. Obviously, Bassmaster had theirs. They felt like it was an unsportsmanlike situation. Uh, we're going to get into that a little bit at the back end of the show. We're also going to talk about James Watson. Out of MLF, out of the BBT, he's been suspended in any MLF potential competition through December 2025, so he will not be able to fish any kind of MLF event until January 2026 if he's reinstated. Now, we talked about at the end of the last episode with Justin Lucas. If you haven't checked that episode out, go check it out, man. It was a it was a fun chat with Justin talking about forward-facing sonar, Santee Cooper, his biggest bag of all time. Go back, listen to that episode. But at the end, man, we talked about a lot of upcoming events. We were in the middle of the Lake Fork event. Uh, Clear Lake showed out earlier this month, uh, early part of March. Ken Mall went in the Clear Lake Toyota Series. Congratulations to Ken. Made some big bags. He ended the tournament with a 30-plus pound sack to take home the win there. Um, Kentucky Lake Toyota event went on. Man, you just got to watch this guy. We've had him on the program before. Jake Lawrence, he won the Toyota event last year at Kentucky Lake. Backs it up with another win. And if I'm not mistaken, he already has two top 10s in the MLF Invitationals early this year. So uh, big shout out to uh, Jake Lawrence and congratulations on that. Man, we're going to get into a little bit with the Red Crest on the back end of the show. We're going to talk about how Dustin Connell brought it home again. Man, maybe one of the best there is. Obviously, we've talked to a lot of guys at Ford Face and Sonar, but I saw some really critical things that went on in this tournament that I think you're going to be interested to hear. Again, we're going to talk about that after our feature angler spotlight with uh, Cody Huff. Um, Gosh, we had a championship here at MLF, or excuse me, at Amistad. We had a championship here at my home lake at Lake Amistad, the NPFL championship. Man, a couple really big bags caught. Uh, first day to make the top 10, took just under 20 pounds, a um, couple 10-pounders caught during the event. And if anybody wants to know, Amistad's kicking them out. We had a big chamber event here the weekend before last, the border bass battle, some more 10-pounders and 9-pounders caught. It There was an 8-hour hourly big bass, and several hours third place wouldn't have been won without a 6-plus pounder. So, man... Amistad's kicking them out. A lot of people talking about how low the water is here. Man, I'm just talking about how good the fishing is right now down here at Lake Amistad. And, uh, man, we just had a Toyota Toledo event go off. Big shout out to Tater Reynolds taking that home. Uh, He's the guide there on the lake. And uh, I also got to give a shout out to Alec Morrison. Kid, Alec is a guy from New York. He's just fishing everywhere, all over the country for the past about 18 months. He finished third place. He's uh, he's an expert also at Ford Facing Sonar. Uh, local Del Rio in uh, Dylan Thompson finished seventh place. And man, everybody knows that watches this uh, podcast that I have a, a youth fishing camp in the summertime. And uh, man, I got to give a big shout out to a camper, Luke Wiley, uh, senior in high school. He was leading going into the last day, man. So many people were pulling for him, but he pulled out a second place finish there at the Toyota Series. And another camper, also in high school, Caden Alexander, finished 24th as a co-angler in that Toyota Series also. So congrats to those guys. Man, just great to see. It looks like we've got Cody Huff real close to us right now. Y'all stay tuned. We're going to stop for a quick break, but we're going to be back here in just a moment with Cody Huff right after this message. Y'all stay tuned. You know the importance of protecting your investments. So choose the protection the pros pick. Grinding sand, abrasive rocks, and concrete ramps are no match for our patented technology. The MegaWare Keel Guard is made tough and made to stick. Install it yourself in less than an hour. Providing the most dependable, most trusted protection for your boat. Guaranteed for life. Insist on the original keel guard the pros have picked for 25 years. MegaWare Keel Guard. (laughs) 
Since 1971, Basscap Boats has innovated, persistently thinking outside the box, never abandoning their roots or the commitment to quality through their process. Clearly visible in the new Puma STS, their design and development continues to evolve, improving performance, enhancing the angler's experience, and broadening the appeal of the sport they have dedicated their lives to. Fast Cat Boats, feel the rush. What's going on? Appreciate you being back here with Bass Edge Radio. We got him on the program. You see him right there. I, Cody, I don't know where you are. It looks pretty cool. It looks pretty nice outside. You got a jacket and the whole nine yards. Uh, tell me about it, man. Thanks for joining us here on Bass Edge Radio. Beautiful day here in southern Missouri. We're just out getting the grill hot. Just nice. Finishing up a little bit of dinner, so don't mind me. Maybe a little smoky for a minute. Yeah, no, that's great. What what do you got on the grill? Let's take a look, man. And just some pork steaks. Uh, nothing too crazy. Just pork <laughs> steaks, and hot, hot dogs, and just uh, nothing too nuts today. Awesome, man. Well, it looks awesome. I appreciate you joining us here on the show. Wanted to break down a little bit of your classic, man. You had a really good performance out there. Let's let's talk a little bit about. You know, I think one of the one one thing that I think is overlooked is you had a great first day, right? I mean, yeah. t- tell us a little bit about that first day, kind of kind of how that went down, and and what was what do you think was special about that first day of competition that put you in contention to uh, potentially win the Bassmaster Classic? You know, day one was like one of those dream days that just does not happen a lot. <laughs> I actually, uh, I went to my but like the first 30, we'll start at like the beginning of practice. So, okay. You know, this was seven days before the first day of the tournament, which is a long stinking time in bass fishing. Everybody knows. Especially in the springtime. Yeah, in the springtime especially. So, uh, first morning of practice, probably within the first hour and a half, uh, I, I found the fish that I ended up catching the first day of the tournament. Um, you know, I wanted to start off my practice really, really shallow. I wanted to try to be in front of them mm-hmm. uh, because at that time it showed we had a really, really good warming trend coming. And sure. I just wanted to, I wanted to do my best to try to be in front of them. And uh, it just seems like, in my opinion, you know, on Grand Lake, like the Ozarks, uh, lakes like that, they just, a lot of the times they live shallow year round anyway. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I, I was just, I was really trying to find them shallow. You know, I didn't really put a lot of time into scoping or anything like that. I just wanted to fish shallow. And, uh, man, first day of the tournament, I rolled into uh, my first area. And I didn't get a, I didn't get any bites for probably the first 30 minutes. I thought, man, that's weird. I, I You know, we had a really warm night last night. I don't know what the deal is. And then all of a sudden, you know, the sun kind of poked up and they all started getting on the cover. And I mean, once, once the sun got up just a little bit, I mean, every log I rolled my little square bill over, they, they just mauled it. Yeah. Yeah. Now you were using the Rapala tiny, right? The yeah. OG tiny. It's a flat side bait. Is that correct? Yeah. It's a flat side bait and it's, uh, it's really, really small and it, it doesn't dive very deep. And I was throwing it on like 14 pound line. So it wasn't going very far down at all. Um, a lot of the fish that I was catching, I mean, they were in less than two feet of water and, uh, there was a few of them that, man, I would, you know, I'd be holding my rod tip up really high and I would be just slow rolling that little square bill over the, I call the square bill, little flat side. Right. Right. Uh, you know, over that tree and it would just start coming over that tree and you just see a big boil and <laughs> it was just, it was a blast. I mean, it's so much. Now, first day of the term, you don't you don't get a whole lot of information. You know, they're they're covering a lot of guys. Um, they talked about it on live that even the local camera boat person didn't know how to get back into this area. Like you were kind of in some backwater stuff. Can you kind of break that down and why you think those fish had moved already so far off the main lake? Because you saw a lot of fish being caught throughout the Bassmaster Classic event, you know, in main drains. You know, I don't want to say in deep water because a lot of them were really shallow, but some of them closer to deep water. Um, Tell me about why you think that's set up differently in this area you you were targeting. 
Uh, so, you know, like the, the area that I, I started in the first day, um, the whole area was really flat. You know, mm-hmm. there wasn't a real defined channel anywhere in that area. Just a lot of flat water. And in my mind, that flat water kind of warms up a little bit faster than that deep stuff. It seems like to me. Um, and the week before we got there, it had been really, really warm also. So I think they had already really started their move. Um, mm-hmm. We were coming on to the full moon uh, the weekend of the Classic anyways. Right. So, But I say that I, I really believe a lot of the fish probably live in these areas for most of the year. When it gets real, real cold, they do prob- they do leave, I'm sure. But, um, you know, there, was a, there wasn't a real big creek ditch back there, but there was a little bit more of a defined ditch. Um, the, they had some water if they needed to slide out of there, you know? Sure. Sure. I I found out how fast they could slide out of there on day two. (laughs) So let's, let's, let's move right into that day two. What, what, what's your feelings the evening after day one? I believe you're in second place. You had 21 and change. Um, you're right on Hamner's, you know, tail, a uh, lot of guys behind you, still early in the event, but kind of what was your thought process that evening before you get into the day two? Man, I was excited because I honestly, I really felt like they were coming to me, you know, because the area that I that I started in and caught that big bag, you know, I caught a few in there in practice. Mm-hmm. And they were all big, but I didn't get a lot of bites, you know. The first day of the tournament was a lot easier to get a bite, and every one of them were big. And uh, you know, the thing that gets me excited is whenever I, whenever I'm catching them like that, and they all look the same. You know yeah. what I mean? You feel like a big school just swam in there, and they were just stopping on every little piece of wood going back. Right. So, you know, catching that many that were all you know big twin four pounders, fat and white, that you felt like they just slid in there. Um, I really thought that they were going to just keep reloading all week. And, uh, you know, after the first day, the temperatures just plummeted. We had, a, we had like a 30 degree night and, uh, big wind. wind that second morning, big wind. You yeah. probably felt like you were okay with that though. Little protected area, backwater ish. Um, yeah. but you, you, so you roll out day two, um, kind of, you know, slide into your, you know, flat area with, with a, some ditch, but isolated cover. T- tell us about it. Man, I, I got back there, you know, and it, honestly, I didn't think that it would change stuff because you know how it is. A lot of times when you get a, you know, some cold weather like that, it might drop it a little bit, but it seems like it takes a day or two of it to kind of make a difference. Yeah. Fish, you know, and I got back there and, and all week I had been seeing – the shad you know i've been seeing carp swimming around you know you could just tell there's a lot of life in the area and um, that second morning i mean it was just you didn't see anything moving <laughs> no you didn't see any shad and uh, you know your, I, ha- your, your hands were cold i'm sure <laughs> uh, but you know i gave them a, a, their fair chance i spent uh, i spent until like 11 o'clock that morning um, I fished, uh, through that area, uh, you know, real thorough, you know, I would crank something and then I would flip it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I was hitting, I was moving real slow and methodical because, you know, my mind, you know, I'm just thinking, you know, get five bites. They're in here. Yeah. Figure out how to get five bites. And, uh, it just wasn't happening. That water actually dropped down to like 52 degrees and it was 62 the afternoon before. Wow. Wow. This, this is where I think. Cody, I, I, um, this is the the move of the classic, in, in my opinion. You've got zero fish, right? It's eleven o'clock. Uh, you spin out of there. Not. It doesn't seem like you spun out, but you just spun out of that backwater, spun out of that those areas, kind of up the river, and and went down lake. What prompted that move? What experience did you have? How can you relate to Bass Edge Nation about? You know, how you make that kind of move? Was it something you saw in pre-practice that were like, okay, well, I know I could go try this. It, kind of kind of walk us through that that decision you made. Yeah, so in practice, you know, it seemed like the majority of my good fish were halfway to three-quarter of the way back in the creeks. You know, mm-hmm. for the most part, that's, uh, that seemed like the deal. And, you know, a lot of these really big ones, I mean, they were in the very back 1% of the creek. You know, they would be in no water. 
Um, so I had ran, I had, I really had four or five areas like the place that I caught them the first day, uh, that I thought were that good. And, uh, you know, I think I just picked one that had all the right ingredients to me to find where they backed out to. So in my mind, I was like, all right, I'm going to find the one that's got a really nice, you know, Creek ditch. Uh, and it's got, you know, the last little bit of deep water in the Creek and, you know, right, by last. Right. Water, I mean, like 10 feet, you know, I found some places that had, uh, you know, some really good, uh, you know, last channel banks and some creeks that had some good little bluffy banks on them. And uh, several of them had boat docks that I was catching them off of, too. But, uh, you know, it was all about what was behind the docks. You know, it was about what the bank actually looked like. It wasn't because the docks were there is why I was gotcha. fishing you know, I was fishing it because of what was behind the dogs. What was now, did it need isolated cover? Was it a type of rock? Can you, can you kind of, you know, throw throw us a bone on what you were looking for back there that, that would help you navigate these areas to put your bait in a high percentage location? Yeah, I mean, obviously, if you had if you had a lay down, it probably had a bass on it, it seemed like. You know, if you could find a piece of wood in the water – you were probably going to catch one off of it, but it had to be in the right spot. It seemed like to me, uh, okay. you know, I was concentrating on the little rock, the, the rockier bluffier banks. Um, you know, the actual, where the actual channel swung, you know, real close to that bank and it was pretty steep. And, uh, you know, like you said, 11 o'clock, I had no bass and, uh, I actually had idled, you know, the, where I was at, you had to idle. And uh, there's a guy that he'd been sticking with me all day. He'd followed me all day. And, you know, most of the, most of the chase boats disperse when you have zero bass. <laughs> right, right, right. God, he's still following me. I was like, man, you got some, you know, you're, you're, you're believing him. You got some faith in me. I appreciate that. He's right. Like, it only takes 15 minutes. And he said that as I was pulled up to this bank and I put the troll motor down and I just pick up a little mini flip jig, uh, and I just start picking stuff apart. And uh, the first bank I went down, I caught like twelve keepers, and wow. like, oh, thank you, Lord, you know. Yeah, what saved my day, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I actually I caught all my weight down that bank except for one. I called one more time after that on a different one on a different bank. Um, now, was this still kind of up the river, or did you get down below Sailboat Bridge to, to make that happen? Um, I was down below Sailboat Bridge. Okay, actually, so you, you did go down. Yeah, I went down. I actually fished my whole tournament down. Um, I never did really go up the river. Okay. Um, I, I spent uh, 90% of my tournament below the bridge. Gotcha. Uh, but, you know, it was just one of those deals. It was real specific. It was hard to find a lot of places that were like the one I caught them. The second day, it seemed like uh, there were so many fish kind of stacking up in those areas, so you could kind of recycle those places and still get bit again and again. Do you think that that was a deal where because that other area you were fishing was just so flat and, and it was affected so much potentially, you know, by the weather, and it sounded like it was – did you feel like – obviously you felt like there was a lot of fish moving in there after the first day, but it was real isolated pieces of cover. Did you – at least from my understanding and, and did it feel like in that situation that man i maybe maybe you didn't pick them all off and some of them moved out but because it was isolated there just wasn't enough fish kind of moving around and feeling comfortable because of the style of topography it had in that area i, I don't know i i just i as good as it was the first day i really felt like they were coming um yeah. And I, and I think that if it would have stayed warm, I really think it would have been a bloodbath. I mean, I think it would have been a lot better for everybody else. I think it would have been a lot better for me. Um, and honestly, you know, a lot of the guys that did really well, um, you know, um, Hamner and Adam and Shakir, they were all kind of in the same area. You know, yeah. they, weren't, they weren't in – they weren't fishing shallow like I was, but they were in the same area. So it's kind of like – a lot of the same fish, you know, that may have kept coming, kept coming to me where you just, th you know, maybe stayed out or went back to some of the stuff that they were catching them off of. So. Right, right. And and I'm not going to name the area. Folks can go back and do their own research if they really want to find out. But historically, it's a great creek. You know, it's it's one of those places that, uh, you know, you hear a lot of, of 
good tournament finishes come out of it, as well as a lot of places on Grand. That's why I think it's so great. I mean, you could win it all the way up the Elk. You win all the way down, down Lake and catch them or some creeks by the dam or in the middle of Lake Drowning or, or where at Horse or, or wherever, all over the freaking lake. It, it's just one of those places that seems to be fairly fertile from front to back, whereas a lot of fisheries aren't like that. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And that's that's just how it is in the Ozarks. It seems like all these lakes around here are just, man, they live everywhere. They're so good. They've got a lot of fish in them. And, uh, I mean, it just it spreads it spreads people out like crazy. And it's uh, it's pretty awesome. I, it's why they're some of my favorite lakes to fish. You know, you don't – these places you don't ever see just a bunch of people all grouped up together. Like, right even though I was around some of these guys until the tournament's over and they're like, Oh yeah, I caught them in there. Oh yeah. I caught them. Right. So, you know, we, <laughs> all of us whacked them in the same areas, you know? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, so, um, you, you recover, uh, well, I'll call it a recover, save your day, save your event. You don't spin out. You have a solid bag on day two. Um, I forget what place were you going into day three? Um, I think I was in third. Again. You were think- still in third, still in third. And although Hamner had kind of created a little bit of space, you know, right. created a little bit of space, but the Grand Lake, anything can happen. Do you feel like, okay, it's day three, you got to swing for the fence? Is that the mentality or is the mentality, man, I just got to keep pushing what I'm doing and hope magic happens? You know, it's a little bit of both. You know, I, I really, I fight with myself on this because I want to say, oh yeah, you know, let's go swing for the fences and see what happens. But in the same, in the same breath, you know, you got to make a business decision too. You know, you're like, man, that's a, that's a lot of money on the line. I don't want to, absolutely. you know, I don't want to drop to 25th place and <laughs> right. lose $25,000 today. Like, I don't want to do that. Right. So this is kind of where my bad decision making kind of kicked in. Okay. was on because you know it was so nasty the wind was blowing like 30 or 40 and i said you know what if there was ever a day for a guy to just go run bluff in stuff run main lake you know windy stuff to try to catch a big bag and make a comeback it's today right and uh you know i tied on a big spinner bait and uh I started just running, you know, those real nasty banks that were just getting smashed by the wind, uh, you know, had those big boulders and just the places you think you're going to catch a big fish. And uh, I I did that again till like 10 o'clock and I didn't have anything. I had like two keepers. What, and- one of the most amazing things to me, it's interesting you say that, um, you know, it makes perfect sense. But man, these fish were like far along. They yeah. were in, I mean, you know, like you say, they weren't like way in the backs necessarily. Maybe some of them were, but man, there wasn't a whole lot of fish caught deeper than about 10 feet. And it, and if they were, it was because it was 10 feet around. It wasn't main lake oriented or creek channel, deep creek channel, main river channel oriented or anything like that. What, why do you think, do you think that and, and it really looked like winter around Grand Lake. There's more foliage and and uh, bloom stuff in your state of Missouri than there was down there at Grand Lake. Yeah. So I've got a couple crazy opinions on, like, you know, why they were shallow and why they were farther back. So the first one, so on Grand Lake and on Lake the Ozarks, I feel like they are, like, you know, the same lake, like they're okay. the same exact deal. They've got a lot of catfish in them. They have a lot of white bass. They have a lot of stuff like that on these rivers. The catfish swim around and seem to rule the roost. Like if you find a ball of shad out in the lake, it's got 10 catfish swimming through it, eating it. So on these places, I've never caught them, you know, floating like they do at table rock and bull shoals and like right. swim bait. It's like they don't do it. It's like their whole life they've kind of been trained, you know, to live on something so they don't get eaten. And uh, so, I mean, that's my first opinion on why, you know, you see guys catching them on the bank. You see them catching them off a brush. You see them catching them off a dock. You see them off a rock. seems like these bass have always been trained to, to live on something, live shallow. It's kind of like their safety mechanism. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and then like step two, uh, it's why like I feel like they were so far along and everybody's catching them so shallow. Like some of those little steeper banks that I was fishing, like behind the docks would be real shallow and then it would kind of roll off. I don't know how many I caught. I would pitch my jig back there and man, they would thump it and you would jerk and nothing. You put back in there, they'd grab your jig and you'd just see your line screaming off and you'd jerk and nothing. And then you flip back in the same spot, they'd finally eat it and you'd catch them. So, I mean, you tell me what that means. That, that sounded like a spawning bass to me. <laughs> On and, and the water's like 52 degrees, but the moon's That's crazy. And it had been warm the week before, so I don't know if they were false spawning or if they were, you know, got locked on the week before when it got up there to that 57, 58. And uh, it was just a few of those ones that were kind of left over. Hmm. Interesting theory, man. Interesting theory. So, uh, man, you get out there day three, you, you save, you know, you cash a good check. You, you do what you do a good, you know, a good business decision, a good businessman move, right? I, I I did, but like like I said, I really feel like I made a bad decision that last day. So I wasted all that time uh, and didn't have them. I said, all right, I'm gonna go back down where I caught on the first day. The sun's out. It's warm enough. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go run through some of that stuff. And uh, I get down there, and there's stinking boats all over it. I hadn't seen a boat all week, and I mean, there was like, I went to two of my best areas, and there were some competitors that were in the tournament in there. And uh, it was just one of those deals that I feel like if I would have went down there first, I would have been better off because the guys that were in there caught them yeah. uh, the last day. So I don't know if that little warmer night kind of moved them up again uh, or what, but uh, I definitely feel like I, I messed up by not going in there first and just trying it. Um, I just tried to trust, trust my gut and figure it out on the fly and catch some big ones. But uh I feel like if I was going to win that tournament, I should have started in there and gotcha. tried to get a good start. So how did you recover that day? I mean, it was a st- tough morning. You go to your your secondary primary area, but you went there secondarily. Um, you know, you, you, you still don't have anything in the live well, and, and you still finished third place. How did the rest of the day boil out for you, and what adjustments were you able to make to be uh, consistent once again on that third day? You know, I just picked up a jig and I just took off um, doing that same last deep water in the creek deal, flipping behind boat dogs, flipping lay downs, flipping anything I could find. And uh, I spent most of my day doing that. And uh, I, I only had about 11, 12 pounds at uh, like, I forget, like 245. And I ran back up the lake, you know, there on Sailboat Bridge. And I had this one stretch that was kind of the same that I had been fishing. And, uh, I pulled up on it, and there's a, a log laying right behind a dock under a walkway, and I rolled a big spinnerbait down and caught like a three and three quarter, and it just, you know, saved my day from, it helped me finish third instead of finishing, you know, probably sixth or seventh. Right, right. Very cool, man. So how how was this experience for you, man? Break it all down for the listeners. Um, you know, some folks have never been to a classic. Some some folks don't understand the process you go through in the introduction of, of the show, I talked about how far away Grand Lake is from Tulsa and, and the crazy, crazy days that y'all had to deal with. Not only did you have to deal with some significant weather on day two and day three with the wind, which always wears out an angler. I don't care who you are standing on the trolling motor, leaning against the wind, that kind of thing. People don't understand how daunting that is, but to be getting up at, 3 30 in the morning not getting home till 8 30 9 o'clock grabbing a meal break it down for the listeners what, what's your take on on the Bassmaster classic this year you know it's such a special tournament and it's such a big deal and we're all so excited for it you know you don't mind all that stuff you block it out and you're just you just tough it out you know there's not really any other options but i'm telling you it's probably the most tired you know the most physically drained i've probably ever been from an event because you know i've fished classics before but i've never yep. fished and been in the top three the whole tournament you know what i mean right you know you you get done with weigh in and then you go to the media room and you do 15 interviews you know and then you you know you're there until you know 8 30 or later 
probably. And then it's time to go rig tackle, you know, then you go <laughs> time rig and tackle and you've got all like, I, this was close enough to home for me. I had so many family and friends that were in town and I felt awful because I didn't have time to see them. Yeah. Um, thank God for my wife. You know, she could just have dinner at the hotel room for me whenever I got done and uh, I would eat a bite, take a shower and hit the sack, you know, and we've got a, a 10 month old little girl. So yeah, she's a lot to handle on your, but she, <laughs> my wife was wrestling her all day and night by herself and letting me get some rest. And, uh, but no, it's, you explained it just perfect. Cause I mean, you lived it, you know, driving for Brian this week, you know, how sure. you, what, you know, how tired it would make you driving that far every day on top of, everything else but uh, like i said it's just such a special tournament you kind of find that extra gear and don't worry about it too much so so how long was your sleep on monday and tuesday <laughs> you know not very long because like i said i got a 10 month old little girl and she <laughs> made the party when the sun comes up and i don't blame her. i hear you i hear you well cody man I, I super appreciate you uh breaking down your classic force you had such a great event i, I think you know, obviously there were other other anglers that did very well, also. But um, I felt like the adjustments that you made from from my perspective that I saw. That's really I, I really wanted to have you on the podcast, so I appreciate you joining us and and breaking it down and just letting people understand. You know how important those adjustments were for you to finish third. And there there were other guys that made adjustments as, as well. But man, I, I just felt like from the pressure situation, from the placement you were after day one, to just kind of hold on and be true to to yourself and and um you know make the important moves that you did was just uh showed a lot of maturity and and still for you as as an angler in a young part of your career. Well I appreciate that man. I had a I had a fun week and as you can imagine, you know, day two at 11 o'clock, my mind was like, you're really going to blow this after 21 pounds. Of but, you know, it's always, uh, it's always fun when you turn it around and make it work. And on top of that, you know, it's a fun time for all the scope haters to, uh, you know, get a good, get a good jab in on them and bust some on a jig and catch them out of the water. Exactly. All Right, and and there was some scoping going on in the dirt, man. I, I I mentioned that in the in the intro, man. I just I think it's a great classic lake. Uh, I think it's tough because it's so far away in Tulsa, uh, but but I also think you know once you go to a classic venue over and over and over, kind of kind of loses a little bit of its you know flavor. <laughs> you know, it gets a little stale. I don't want to say stale, but it just doesn't have the same pop. You know, but uh, man. Um, I don't think going back to Grand could ever be a mistake. So it's it's a great lake and, and a fun place to watch a derby just because there's always so much going on. I think you go two or three weeks from now, it even gets that much better. Um, more big fish, uh, even more patterns maybe in play. I think you still could have the jerk bait thing going. Still, you know, could have some spawning fish going, dock fish going. I mean, Play, it's places endless with uh, possibilities, so it's it's a cool venue for sure. Um, you mentioned earlier, uh, similar to uh, Lake of the Ozarks, um, is that somewhere that you spend a lot of time, Cody? You know, it's really not. I go up there for a Toyota Series here and there because uh, that's usually where they go for um, the yeah. division closest to me. They go there a lot, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll go there once or twice a year. I don't spend a lot of time up there. There's too many. Too many people for this guy, you know. I, <laughs> as you can tell, I I don't live uh, anywhere too close to anyone. <laughs> yeah, but, man, that's a beautiful sight right there. I love yeah. it. I love it. Look that up. doesn't look too far from my sight here out my backyard either, dude. I don't. I grew up in the Washington D.C. area, and uh, <laughs> I was able to get out when I was 35 and move down here to South Texas. And uh, man, I, I'll never regret a minute of it. I love your view. I got a view very similar, and I think that's a a great way to enjoy life for sure. Absolutely is. Man, there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's it. All right, Cody. Well, hey, man, thank you so much for joining us here on Bass Edge Radio, breaking down that uh, big time classic deal. And uh, man, I hope you do well. You got a couple of a uh, couple of elite series events coming up back to back in Florida in a few weeks. It's going to be a quick turnaround. Well, Thank you. Good luck, man. All right, Cody Huff, man. Appreciate you being here. Y'all stay tuned. We're going to be back right after this short break. Plenty of sunshine. Come on, man. Let's roll.
What the? To catch the fish, you need to be one with the fish. With PowerPole shallow water anchors, you'll get the ultimate in precision, power, and control so you can catch more fish. No face paint or phony fins necessary. Excessive shock and vibration are two leading causes for premature battery failure. Prolong the life of your batteries with the new MegaWare Battery Guard. The Battery Guard sits under your battery and absorbs excessive vibration and bounce, reducing G-Shock by up to 80%. Great for boats or anywhere shock and vibration can damage a battery. The Battery Guard can easily be trimmed to fit virtually any custom shape or battery size. Save money by protecting your batteries. Spend more time on the water and less on maintenance. Find yours at MegaWare.com. Hey, 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 here we are, back at it, Bass Edge Radio. Man, always always great to have Cody up. That's the second time he's been on the program. If, uh, if you like what Cody had to say, please go back, look at our archives. We have all of our podcasts archived on our website, BassEdge.com. 420 episodes. This is episode 420. Got to give a big shout-out to uh, MegaWare, Keelguard, Man, you always want to keep your boat protected from abrasive rocks, grinding sand, and concrete boat ramps. Make sure to get a keel guard on your boat. So many great products from MegaWare. You've got the uh, Flex Step Battery Guard, um, Bow Scuff Buster. Just a, a lot of great products there from MegaWare. Be sure to look at them all. MegaWare.com. So here we go. Back at it, man. I want to. I want to. Touch on a few things we talked about in the intro. Give you some some of my feedback. If you haven't heard, man, uh, Brian Brian New, excuse me, Bassmaster Elite Series angler DQ'd from the Santee Bassmaster Open. I was able to get a little bit of insight on this situation. Uh, I have not talked to Andrew Upshaw, but um, it looks like uh, Andrew was involved in part of this situation where there was a protest for unsportsmanlike conduct during the Santee Bassmaster Open against uh, Brian New. The situation was that uh, Brian was fishing for a bedfish, uh, made, made a decision to kind of disturb the area um, so that, uh, you know, a fish that he could not catch so he could come back and catch it later, kind of protect the area, protect the zone by, uh, dusting the area out. Um, maybe not great for the fish. I'll admit that, but, uh, obviously the fish was still there to be caught. I think all of us go over beds with our trolling motors, maybe not always specifically intentionally to, uh, blow some, some dirt around, but, um, or mud around. But um appears that, you know, some anglers saw this. It was brought to the attention of Bassmaster. They deemed that as unsportsmanlike. That was the rule cited in this disqualification. So uh, Brian knew, again, DQ'd from the Bassmaster Open. Tell me what you think in the comments section below, please. Love to hear what your thought process is. Um, is it because it was seen as uh, intentional that, that this became unsportsmanlike? It's something that we all do at some time or another, whether we see the fish or not. Does it really harm the fish? Um, the fish is still there to be caught. Matter of fact, Brian went later on that day to try and catch the fish again, uh, still to no avail. But uh, the, the fish was still there and, and fine. So I'm interested to hear your all's comments on what you think about that. Um... Second big thing, the Watson. James Watson out of the Bass Pro Tour uh, seemingly through the 2025 season. Not only out from the Bass Pro Tour, but out from any MLF competition. Uh, BFL, Toyota Series, Federation tournaments, uh, whatever it might be. If it's MLF sanctioned, it is no go for Mr. Watson. Um, James has had some tough things to say about MLF. Uh, some may agree, some may disagree. Um, I would assume this was primarily spawned from some apparel that uh, James became associated with the uh, um, boat dock apparel, um, fish boat docks, FBD. You could take that a lot of different ways, and it is in the same colors 
as Mr. Boyd Duckett, the traditional yellow and red. So um, obviously you can read between the lines there. And uh, maybe that was the last straw for Watson after having a strong event at Santee. Uh, finished top 10 in the championship there. But uh, an interesting situation there. Maybe the first big DQ by an organization to an angler who talked or represented a league despairingly. So uh, interesting to see that. Um, we kind of broke down all the tournaments that were uh, had recently gone on, which there was a ton, um, just a ton of freaking events going on. And there's a ton left to go. Uh, coming up next event, MLF at uh, Smith Lake. So that's going to be fun to watch the um, – I believe that's the Toyota series there on Smith Lake, April 4th through April 6th, coming up just next week. I kind of like these midweek events, by the way. These like Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday deals, or, uh, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday events. Man, I think that is the way to go for these uh, AAA events. You're already taking time off during the week. You can travel back home on the weekends. If you want to take some extra time the week before, it's there possibly. But the big thing is you avoid all the big weekend crowds. I think that's a big deal. So I like seeing those. We've got also a Bass Pro Tour event coming up at Dale Hollow, April 9th through the 14th. We've got a Toyota Series Plains Division on Grand Lake. How will that boil down? Probably fish going to be on beds there at that time. Will the water clean up? Will they be able to see them to catch them off beds there? It's probably going to be a non-scoping event as we just saw in the Classic, although plenty of scope used, but not like your traditional catching floaters with the scope. Then we've got the uh, Elite Series back-to-back -back in Florida, Harris Chain and St. John's River. Uh, that's the Harris Chain, April 11th and the uh, through April 14th, and the St. John's River, April 18th through April 21. I'm going to be at the Juan Bass Open at Clear Lake, March 17th through the 19th. I am looking forward to that. Going to be some big ones caught there. Got to break out all the old big swim baits. Got some big old bass down there. But uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of, of serious talk on the Red Crest. Man, we, we really haven't talked a whole lot about the Red Crest. I heard the crowds there were not very good. Not, not very good crowds. So still in the building process. I believe this is Red Crest number four. I believe it was number four. Dustin Connell's second Red Crest. Um, and and uh, so th this, uh, Edwin Evers has a Red Crest. Uh, Brian Thrift has a red crest red crest win so um this red crest though took place on lay lake there in alabama scope fest absolute scope fest the the biggest i think what from what i saw on live the the best angler non-scoping was takahiro omori through the bladed jig for largemouth primarily throughout the event in shallow grass had a, had a good event obviously any top 10 is very good but uh, it dominated this this event by by scope. Alton Jones Jr. finishing second place to Dustin Connell. Um, you had uh, Ron Nelson up on the dam doing very well. Not quite using as much scope, but definitely using those current breaks up there seemed to be more his his rely. Michael Neal opened this this tournament uh, with some crazy amounts of weight scoping them. And uh, all these fish, what they call floaters, what you might call floaters, these fish coming very shallow underneath the surface of the water, uh, many of them zero to seven feet uh, out in the middle of either the river channel or in the middle of pockets. Um, I mentioned previously that I thought that there were some really important takeaways from that process. And most of it was the fact that if you really watch close to Dustin Connell and Alton Jones Jr., who, who did the best, really Alton Jones had a great second, third period of that championship round. Um, you know, he was still a long ways from catching Connell, but man, he was, he was doing some work. Connell obviously did work the entire day, catching 80 plus pounds of bass on, on the uh, forward facing sonar, but it was short cast, short cast. It wasn't, you know, seeing fish 60, 70, 80, 90 feet away on the forward-facing sonar. It was a lot of 20, 30, 40 foot away. You could see underhand pitches with spinning rods. 
Most of this, again, went down with a jig head minnow. But you could see these underhand pitches with the spin rods. So these guys really dialing this into another level where you thought, man, there was going to be massive waves of fish coming up to the bank at Lay Lake. Still lots of floaters out there, lots of fish associated, still trying to warm up, kind of take in that warmth, get the get their bodies warmed up to get ready to lay eggs and get ready to spawn. That's what I feel like these floaters were doing out there. They were kind of getting closer to the surface so they could get more of that sunlight, more of that warmer water condition. Obviously, Takahiro did that with largemouth in the shallow water, but uh, these guys really, I mean, Connell, Alton Jones Jr., those two were the best at it. Really knocked them dead up there on that forward-facing sonar. Again, not with long pitches. That was uh, that was really telling for me. Something new in that forward-facing sonar realm, I feel like. And, uh, man, I, I feel, you know, there's some lakes that are just forward-facing sonar lakes. There's other lakes that are okay for forward-facing sonar. We're, we're seeing this kind of revelation occur now that we're seeing – a lot of people try to take advantage of this tactic and this technique on different bodies of water. Um, obviously, it's working on a lot of them, but there, there's a few where it's just not quite as dominant as the other. And uh, still interesting to see where where this whole thing's going to break down in the future. So, uh, man, that that's pretty much a wrap. I want to I want to thank again Cody Huff for being with us, and uh, thank again uh, Bass Cat Boats for being a part of of uh, my angling career and, and Bass Edge Radio, uh, Megaware Keelguard, the primary sponsor here of Bass Edge, also in association with Power Pole. Thank the, those guys for being here. Make sure you hit that subscribe, like, comment below, man. I really want to hear what you think about the Watson deal. want to hear what you think about the Brian New DQ. Um, anything else you'd like to hear right here. This, this podcast is for Bass Edge nation for you guys for me i love joy talking about bass fishing you want to hear something new about the show let me know about it i'd love to hear about it man it's been great being here again for another episode stay tuned we're going to come back with you in another couple weeks another episode we're going to be on the road we're going to do an on the road episode of bass edge radio that's right we're going to be uh, over there at clear lake in california so uh stay tuned for that that's going to be a lot of fun as well again appreciate y'all being here This is Bass Edge, Kurt Dove. I'm out. Adios, y'all. Have a great Easter weekend. Bye-bye.